Okay, hi everyone. I hope this video finds you well. So today we are going to talk about arrays and then we are going to talk about uh, multi-dimensional arrays, both how to create and use and how to pass to functions. Then we are going to conclude with vectors and um, this is just introduction to vectors, how to create and use vectors, how to pass them to functions and so on. So before we start the lecturing part, I want you to create a new project on Visual Studio and you can call it Sandbox 7 and um, keep this project because you may need it when you um, review these slides for the exam. Um, you would find it handy. Okay, so how much data can a variable hold? For example, if I give you this, int num. Now, int num, how much data this variable can hold? Now, the answer to this is easy because it holds only one integer. Now, if I ask you, what can we do if we need to hold 30 integers? So, suppose I have 30 students in my class and I want to store all their scores. So, you would say, Okay, I need basically 30 integers, right? 30 variables. But basically, this is not very useful. So, the solution to store many, uh, many pieces of data is to have a list. Now, a list allows the storing of a like similar data. The, when I say similar data, I mean data of the same data type. So a list is go, we are going to have two kinds of a list. One is going to be the array and two is vector. Now, C++ provides you with two list mechanisms. Now you can have arrays and those are traditional and important because they are they have been used in the old libraries in C and we are going to continue using them in C++ but they are restricted in their use we have also container classes so next semester in CS1432 uh, you're going to talk about a lot about container classes today we are going to introduce only the victors so container classes basically are provided by the STL, the send template library. And um, vectors are um, a good example of these container classes. You can have also um, queues, stacks, maps, and all these things. So basically, they're relatively new to C++. And they are more flexible. And they have a little bit better features than arrays. Better features than arrays. But usually we have the similar ideas. They store alike or similar data of uh, similar data types. So array overview. Suppose we want a collection of 10 ints. So an array is similar to a collection of mailboxes. Because you're going to see your mailbox, if you're living in a building where you have multiple mailboxes, you have an access to one of them, right? And you will see that mailboxes are uh, next to each other, sitting next to each other. And you would need, you would need an accessor to um, your mailbox. We are going to see what that is like in C++. So basically first, to create an array, you would need a data type, a variable name, and these square brackets, and the size of your array. So what we store in our array, what we store in our array, is basically called an element. An element. Now, regardless of the data type, Generally, we call the piece of data stored in each mailbox, for example, an element. Now, this is how we create an array, 
and everything inside is called an element. Now, all of the array elements are of the same data type. So what do we call this data type? We call it the base type. The base type. Why do we call the base type? Because it's a base for every element. Whenever you reach an element, any element, pick up a random element. For example, this one. This must be an integer because we created an array of integers. So basically, again, array is a collection of data. Referred to by one variable, which is this one. So... Elements of an array are accessed by using indexing or subscripting with the array name. So basically, if I want to access any of these data, basically, again, if you're uh, accessing your mailbox, you need the number of your mailbox and you need a key, right? So how do we have that? You can... Think of the variable name with those square brackets as your key and then you want your mailbox number so I want the fifth element so uh, sorry the fifth element that would be a of 4 why is that because with arrays we start with 0 we start with 0 so fifth element is going to be 5 minus 1 so index of 4 index of 4 you are going to get used to it because we are going to use arrays a lot so basic array definition when creating an array you need a data type and you need a variable name and you need the size and to tell the compiler that this is an array those are the indicators that this is an array so in grades 25 this means we are creating an array of 25 elements now the index is the valid valid indexes of this array is 0 to 24 0 to the size minus 1 which is 24 so we can also use an initializer list to initialize an array when the array is being created. The initializer list is this. You have curly braces and you have elements inside. So basically if I do int nums of five, this is an array of five elements. This is an array of five elements. And if you want to initialize it to fill the five elements immediately, then you can use initializer list. Open that initializer list and put the elements inside. One, two, three, four, and so on. Now, if you want to initialize all the elements to zero, upon creation, you can do in grades 100. This is 100 elements, uh, 100 grades all filled with zeros so all elements are equal to zero if you want to initialize some elements then you create an array then equal this is the first element this is of index zero the second element of index one then the rest will be zeros so basically you're not saying the first half is 10 as 100 and the second half of the array is 50 no you're saying the first element is 100, the second element is 50, and the rest of them is are zeros. So, you can abandon the size if you're using initializer list. So, I can just do int, array, whatever, um, the variable name, this is a variable name, um, and the compiler is going to deduce the um size by the number of elements you put inside this initializer list so we have five elements then this is an array of five this is an array of five so how do we access the array elements we access them by 
the name and the index by the name and the index this way so if I want to access the first element of this array I do a of 0 now I can assign 53 to a of 0 which is the first element so I store 53 in the first element I can do a of 9 I'm storing in a of 9 because I have an assignment I'm storing in a of 9 basically this is the tenth element this element a of 0, I'm retrieving the uh, A of 0, which is 53, plus 5. So that is storing 58. I can still access elements beyond the size of the array. This is why we say arrays are usually dangerous, because there is no bound checking. No bounds checking. So we can say array a of 10 equal a of 9 uh, times 4. This is going to take the 52 times um, 4, which is 232, and store it in this place. If you are reading this one, or if you read um, a of 15, this will read a of 15 and will give you a garbage value. So there is no bound checking with arrays. So, one more thing before I uh, continue. The size. How do you put the size? How do you specify the size? Now, the size when you create an array is one of two things. One of two things. Either a literal value like this, 10, 15, whatever you want, or a constant variable. A constant variable. Only those two. You cannot have a variable like ask the user for input, like for example, C in size, then say um, this is size. No, you cannot do that. Only if it's a constant variable, which is a variable that is being um, assigned as a constant and assigned value upon creation, or a literal value like 10, 15, 20, whatever you want. So if we want to fill an array with anything but zeros, all the elements with, uh, for example, ones, with zeros you can do this, right? But if we want ones, twos, or whatever we want, then we have to go through every element with a for loop or a while loop or whatever you want. Usually we use a for loop because it's more convenient to use with arrays. So, because they have counters. So, for int i equals 0, i less than 10, i plus plus, what you do is assign every element, assign every element with 1. Every element, how so? Nums with i, and i is being changing every iteration. Starting with 0 up to 9. Okay, so class activity for you. Create an int array that can hold 10 integers and initialize them all to zero. Then, using a for loop, change the values so that the array has the values ranging from 10 to 100. Counting by tens. So the first element, or not the first element, this is up to you, but if you want, you can store the um, first element, 10. You can create an um, array of 11 elements if you want, and keep the first one empty, or 0. And um, the first one would be 10 and 12, um, 20 and so on. But what I want you to do is to only have 10 integers. So, ranging from 0 to 9. And in the first element, you would have 10, the second, you would have 20, and so on. Then you use another for loop to print out the array, and every element is going to be an element per line. An element per line on the console. So, pause the video, work on that exercise. Once you are done, come back to see the answer. So a possible answer would be is creating an array and um, initializing all the elements to zero, ten elements, and we initializing all of them to zero. Then you can do int 
fill num equal 10 and you can do for int i equals 0 i less than 10 i plus plus you can then do array of i is going to be equal fill num which is going to be the first one 10 then increment by 10 so the second is going to be filled with 20 30 and so on then use this to print I'm going to show you um, how I'm going to do that differently so I'm going to copy that code put it into my um, Visual Studio then um, run it for you first so you can see it's going to be 10 20 and so on um, an element per line then I'm going to uh, tweak it to show you another possible answer here is the result okay let me just give you another idea of how to do this thing so you can do in here i plus one times ten and you can get rid of this one what is this doing basically this is saying i when i is zero i plus one this is zero plus one one times ten so start ten then one when i is one one plus one two times times ten basically this is twenty and store this so are we getting the same answer the same result yes we do so you can have this the way you want you can have this the way you want um, this is why I always say in my um, slide possible answer because it's not the only answer in the world you can create uh, you can come up with another answer okay so reading from a file into an array so um, assuming that fin the, basically this is a file stream uh, variable of inputs um has been already created and has opened the file so we are creating an array of array size as i said you can have only either a constant like this one or a literal value and we have counter and we use this as a temp to read the inputs from the file so we say while counter the counter is less than the array size and you can read from the file into the current input put the current input the thing you have just read into um, the array so this is assuming this is starting with zero so this is putting first in the element zero element one element two and so on and um, when you put that input in the array increment the counter so that goes from 0 to 2 to 1 1 to 2 and so on okay so this part is going to be true if it was able to do a read right so only if you can read this is going to return true we have seen this in the files lecture in the um, previous lecture so can we just shorten that into um, instead of having count? Oh, first, let me answer this question. What is count equal to when this code finishes? When this code finishes, what is counter? So the counter basically is the number of the n thread. The number of the n thread. So this stops when you have a false read or um, when you couldn't read or when this counter reaches the array size, right? So it's going to be the number of in thread, generally. So can we shorten this? Can we abandon this variable, get rid of this variable, and just make it directly sorting into, a, uh, into the array? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can take it directly from um, the file into a variable, right? Because this is considered also a variable, right consider a variable okay can we shorten to this this is a shorter version can we have a shorter version like this and we have an empty loop whether you have a semicolon or just empty brackets no this is not it's not actually a good code 
because it's going to throw your counter off. Now, before you think that it's because of a semicolon, because it's an empty loop, no, it's not. It's not because of that. It's because where you place the counter plus plus. So this would throw our counter off when we end um, due to the end of file. Because the end of file is going, remember, this is going to try to read, right? The attempt to read is going to increment the counter. Now, whether the attempt returns false or returns true, this is going to be incremented anyway, right? So this would throw your counter off. So the correct way to do it is this way, having the incrementation inside the while loop block. Okay, so after the previous code, after we read from a file, putting that into a, an array, we can uh, now display the number of elements we have uh, read. So here is a counter, because th this is why actually we said we don't want to throw your counter off. It's not going to affect the array, but if you are going to depend on your counter to uh, display the elements in your array, then you would read an extra garbage value. If you do only this one, this one, which is correct, then this code is also going to be correct. It's going to read only the elements that you have read. So for int i equals zero, i less than the counter, um, i plus plus or plus plus i, doesn't matter, um, and then print the element. Okay, so let's talk about passing arrays to functions. So arrays are always passed by reference, and this is one of the most important statements in C++. Arrays are always passed by reference without the need for the ampersand. So arrays do not know their sizes, so we need to pass it as an argument. So if we have a function prototype and the function prototype has an argument of an array, uh, usually you would have this array, like int array, and um, you would have the size as another parameter, the size of the array. And const, const in the uh, function prototype, means, uh, or in the function declaration, means that this array not to be modified. Because remember, if you're passing by reference, inside your function, you can modify the argument, whatever being passed, right? But if you're passing by constant reference, then um, this is going to be um, not modifying the argument. So if we have some array basically that sums the elements of the array and here's an array we are passing and when you pass, when you pass an array, you pass only the name. Do not, do not pass nums and square brackets. This is wrong. Only the name. So we pass the name. Some array and we pass the name and for this is going to sum these four elements. So this is summing them to 10. Some array nums and two, this is um, passing the array and summing only up to two numbers. So this is displaying three. Some array when you pass this, this is going to throw you an error. Why? Because you're passing an element, basically this is int, and what we expect is int array, not just one element, not a variable of int, right? So this is going to be an error. An array is just passing the name. Okay, here is the sum array um, function. We pass the um, array and the size and again we made it const because const means um, that this function not to modify the array being passed. So we just do in total equals zero then we, we add every element to the total.
and that's it. And then we return the hello. So because an array doesn't know their sizes, um, it must be passed as parameter. The size must be passed as a separate parameter. Remember that. So a class exercise, I'm going to give you that as, as an example. Uh, it's not an exercise. So problem, write a function to find the smallest value in an array of integers. The input, the parameters, would be two things, the array of integers and the size. The output is going to be the smallest value in an array. Note, array shouldn't be changed. This means use const. Right? This means use const. So, if we are using um, this array, of these elements, 388, negative 7, 9, 1, 24, and we use find smallest number, which is the name of my array, and 6, the number of elements in my array, this should return the smallest one. The smallest one, as you can see, is the negative 7. Now, if I have int list 3, I have 12, 9, and 45, now you can either initialize your array using initializer list or you can use um, them initializing them independently. So find smallest list 3, this is going to return the 9, right? So basically, basically, if you're doing such thing, finding the smallest or the largest, always set the smallest to the first element. If you're finding the largest, the largest to the first element, not to zero. Do not say zero. Because in this case, in this case, it's going to always um, compare the smallest, which is the zero, to three, then says no, zero is less than three. Keep the zero, keep the zero. Then negative 7, keep the 0, keep the 0, keep the 0, okay, uh, sorry, keep the negative 7. This one finds it. But wait a second, for this one, what is the smallest number? The smallest number is 9, but wait a second, if you have a smallest, equals 0. So is 0 less than 12? Yes, keep the 0. Is 0 less than 9? Yes, keep the 0. Is 0 less than 45? Yes, keep the 0. So the smallest element in this array is 0? No, it's 9. So this is a mistake. Always have the first element as the smallest or the largest if you're finding either. So finding the smallest, we are going to compare. This is what I've been doing when I explained this, right? So comparing, it read over every element in my array and find, uh, compare this to the smallest. If it's less than, if the element you are at is smaller than the smallest, this variable, then store that element that you're at in the smallest. Eventually return the smallest. That's it. So using find the smallest in this list, this one returns the negative 7, and this one returns the 9. So remember some things. One, arrays are always passed by reference without the need of the ampersand. This is from C. Use const if you don't want your array elements to be changed. Do not need to include the array size in the brackets in here. No. Use, pass them as a separate parameter. Okay, so class activity. Redoing the RAND checker. Remember the RAND checker, that one um, where you generate random numbers? So create an array of size 11 and initialize all the elements of, you, of your array to zero. Use a for loop to create a 10,000 random integers ranging 1 to 10. Inside the loop, increment the locations in the array to count the numbers 1 to 10. And print the elements of the array. So this is generating your index number. 
if this index happens, then you increment that number. Okay? So parts you may need, this is some hints. One, here is how you initialize your elements to zeros. Then you can create an, uh, a variable and then set that variable to create a random number in the range 0 to 10. Now, um, this creates, z uh, sorry, 1 to 10. This creates 0 to 9. And when you do plus 1, this becomes 1 to 10. Right? Remember that from lecture 2. Then, once you find your random number, use it as the index to increment the location. Increment the location. So the element is going to be incremented. So if I have something like this, and the random number is 0, so 0, I increment this one. Remember, all these were zeros, right? So 0, 1, 2, up to 9. Or in this case, we are having 0 up to 10 because we have 11 locations. So if that, and that is going to give me 1 to 10. So if that is 1, I increment this one and becomes 1. If that is um, 9, then I increment this one to be 1. Then in the other iteration, we are doing 10,000 iterations. So in the other iterations, go, going back to 1, then I increment this one and so on. So pause the video, work on this exercise, and come back to see the answer. Okay, so here is the answer. Uh, answer that you can use. So strand times zero, this is um, generating a different sequence uh, of random numbers every time you run your program. And const int um, n equal 11. This is uh, my size of the array. And then I put it in here and initialize it to zero. So int i, I do 10,000 iterations. Here is, I'm doing 10,000 iterations. And i equal random mod 10 plus 1, basically this is the one, and um, then when I get i, I increment the location, and then I print my elements. So, um, basically, not this one, um, let's go back to this. So, going back to this, let me just copy the code so you get to see it in um, the Visual Studio, here it is. So, as random, you would need to include C time to be able to use time. And for the random numbers uh, in um, Visual Studio 2019, it would work without including the CSTD lib library. Um, but in some other um, compilers, it won't work until you include the CSTD lib. So I would include it to be on the safe side. S uh, CSTD lib. This one. I run my program. I should get um, the first element of zero, and the other ten elements would be with some numbers. So here it is. Ten thousand numbers okay so common task we do for arrays we do searching and we do sorting searching when you search for uh, when you search for a specific element in the array sorting if you are sorting the element uh, the elements ascending uh, or descendingly so smallest to largest or largest to smallest. So the searching um, is to determine whether a value, a key, is found in the array. Now the solution is to check the element. If the element equals a key in your array, return the location, the index. If not found, return the size. And here is the algorithm for it.
here's the function int search because it returns an int if it's an int array if it's double then double and double and so on right so int search const int list because const because we don't want to modify it we are just looking into it right so we provide the size and the key we provide the size and the key for int i equals zero i less than size i plus plus if if the list of i if the element i'm iterating over is equal to the key return i if that loop did full iterations without finding the element return the size so the runtime of this algorithm is dependent on the elements and the number of elements so one usage of my search algorithm is if I created an array of a specific size and partially I fill this array partially like for example this way and I have um, three, five, um, two, and those are empty. Um, I ask the user for a target. What element you are trying to look for? Then I provide the search function with my array, the size used, assuming that I'm using three elements. I'm just looking into three elements, those three elements, three elements, and target. So, this is going to return it. So assuming that the user is looking for um, the number four, this is our target, right? This is our target. Now if spot, now spot is going to return the location. Remember, spot is returning the location, the index. Now if spot is not equal to size used, so we are going to look into this array is three equal to four no is five equal to four no is two equal to four no then we return this the size used right we return the size used so spot is going to be three so is three not equal to size used is three not equal to three no so we go to the else if is the size used less than the size the size is six i have six elements in my array three of them are empty so yes then i would add this target into my array where i use the index return so return three zero one two three four five right so I go to values of three, which is this location, right? And equals target, equals target. So this is four. Now my size used is incremented to four. This is tracking how many elements are actually filled with valid data. Okay, so let's look into something. Let's look into something that is inside the array let's look into five this is our target five so this is going to do the search and so on so value size used is basically four and um target is five the spot returned is one right so this is one is one equal to size used four is it not equal to yes it's not equal to so we say okay values of spot values of one which is five is already in the array um let's add another um, two elements 11 and seven okay now let's look into something that is not inside the array um let's look for 17. so target is 17. the size we are using is six and spot is going to look into the array and find nothing so it returns six right so is six is not to size used 
No, it's the same. So else if is size used less than size is six less than six. No. So do this. Do the else values array are already f is already full and we couldn't add target. This is one usage of this search um, function. Okay, let's talk about sorting. Now sorting, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to teach you how to do them manually. We have. We are going to discuss two types of sorting. I'm going to uh, actually teach you how to do them manually and um, how to do them in code. So problems of sorting is basically arranging the elements so they are ordered, whether they are in ascending order or descending order. Now, the major task in um, sorting is the comparison and moving elements. You're comparing elements and moving them. So too easy to remember sorting algorithms. Um, those are the two things I'm going to teach you today. The selection sort and the bubble sort. The selection sort and the bubble sort. And you have to understand this very well. So the selection sort. Selection sort is so easy. On the i-th iteration, place the i-th smallest element in the i-th location. So in other words, in the first iteration, I guarantee you that the smallest inner if we are doing ascending order. I guarantee you the smallest element is going to be at first. And the first element. In the second iteration, the second smallest is going to be in the second element. And so on. That's it. That's it. So basically, if I'm going to do this, 7, 21, um, 89, uh, 5, 89, 2. So 7, um, 21, 5, 89, 2. 21, 5, 89, 2. This is the array I'm trying to sort, right? So I'm going to have something in here. I'm going to call it my smallest. So this is going to be smallest. This is smallest. And I'm going always to put the first element inside. So let me just do 7, right? 7 in the smallest. The first iteration, I find the smallest, I find the smallest, and I modify the array. I modify the array. Every time I write something in here is going to be the modified array, and so on. So, I start with the next element. Is 21 smaller than 7? No. Is 5 smaller than 7? Yes. So, that is 5. Because 5 is the smallest right now. And always I'm comparing to the smallest. Okay, continue. 85. Is 89 smaller than 5? No. Is 2 smaller than 5? I'm always comparing this. Yes. So, 5 is going to be replaced with what? With the 7. So, my current array is going to be 5, 21, 5, 89, and 7. And 7. Okay, so I do the same thing. Now, I get, uh, sorry, that is 2. That is 2. That should be 2, right? That is 2. So this is going to be 2 and 7. Okay, then I clear the smallest and I start again. I start again. So, my... I guaranteed that this is the smallest, right? So I don't, I don't touch it. I start from here. I put this one in here. So 21. Start comparing. Is 5 smaller than 21? Yes. Is 89 smaller than the 5? No. Is 7 smaller than the 5? No. So, okay. So I put this the way it was, 2. Then I come, I just replace those two. So 5. 21 and 89 and 7. Then start from here because I guaranteed after two iterations that the smallest is in here and the second smallest is in here. So I guaranteed that this is the case. So smallest is going to be this. 
um, 21st, right? 21. So 21 compared with 89. 89 smaller than 21? No. 7 smaller than 7? Yes. Yes. If yes, then swap those. So 2, 5, the way they were, and 7, 89, and 21. The last iteration would be doing this. And let me just use the black. Okay, now we are here, right? So 89. 89, and I compare 21. Is 21 less than 89? Yes, so 21. And those are placed. So 2, 5, 7, 21, 89. Do I still have any elements to compare with? No. So that's it. We are done. Okay. So here it is. 7 is swapped with, with 2. 21 is swapped with 5. 21 is swapped with 7 then. Then 89 it will be swapped with 21. The way I just showed you. So here is the selection sort algorithm. It's void. It returns nothing, it's just sorting. And it's not const int array because you know the modification is uh, immediate, right? Is immediate on the actual array. The swapping when you are done is on the actual array. And we need embedded for loops, two for loops. The first one is going to store the location where we start. Because remember, the first time we start on the first element, the next we are starting on the second element and so on. This is being incremented, right? So this is the location of the smallest. Then we do another for loop inside, the for loop that does the swapping and comparing, right? So for n j, starting from where? Starting from the next element. So this is the location of the smallest. Okay, I start from the next one. The way I just showed you. The way I just showed you in here. We always, if we start with 7, then we say, okay, we start, we compare with 89, right? So, if array of j, if array of j, less than array of the location of the smallest, my current, location of the smallest equals j, and so on, and so on. So, the way I showed you in here, I was showing you the elements themselves. In the algorithm, we are using the indices of each element, of the elements. So I'm saying 3, location of the smallest, then with 4, then with 5, right? But what I was actually comparing the locations, um, the uh, elements. So I was doing things right. Okay, so um, we said that then, eventually, after this for loop is done, so we say... If, if I is not the location of the smallest, if we have to swap, swap them, the way we swap them. And that's it. This is the selection sort. So the speed of sorting algorithms, it's a common question. It's a common question. What is the speed of the algorithm? What is the space complexity, speed complexity, and all these things? These things are in CS233. These are things in um, data structures and algorithm analysis. So let's talk about bubble sort. And with bubble sort, I want you to focus on what I'm doing because it's a little bit tricky, but it's uh, to me, it's easier than the selection sort. It does not need all of us, and it's um, actually nicer than the selection sort. So the bubble sort, you need to loop through all the arrays uh, elements and you compare adjacent pairs, only the adjacent pairs of elements. And if they are out of the order, swap them. Okay, remember with the selection sort, I said I guarantee you that after the first iteration, you have the smallest number in the first element. Can I say the same thing on the bubble sort? No, it's the opposite. So, after the first iteration, I guarantee you, you have the largest element in your array at the last location. 
at the last location. So here is the bubble sort. It's a little bit easier. Um, bubble sort that takes in and the size, but it has two for loops immediate without the locations, without um, to store the location, without any of these um, things. The first one is going to looping to be looping through zero to n minus one because remember you are comparing the adjacent elements, and I'm going to show you why n minus one. And the other one is going to start from 0 to n minus i minus 1. If you need, uh, you compare always the adjacent elements, right? j to j plus 1. If, um, there, if this one is bigger than the following, swap them. Immediately swap them. That's it. I'm going to give you the same example, 7, 21, 5, 89, and 2. So, 7, 21, um, 89, 5, and 2. Right? Was it the same? No, it was uh, 5, 89. Okay, doesn't matter. 5, 89. So let me just show you how this is being done. So you're always comparing um, the adjacent pairs and you're asking yourself a question, always, always. So you start with this one, right? And you compare it to this one. You're asking yourself a question, is this one bigger than this one? So is the seven bigger than 21, larger than 21? The answer is no. So move on. No, move on. We move on. 21 and 5. Is that 25? Uh, so if, if you didn't do anything, just put this, this uh, the way it was. So 7. Then move on. 21 and 5. 21 and 5. Is 21 bigger than 5? Yes, so swap them, 5 and 21. Now we guarantee this is going to be smaller because then we are, the next iteration we are going to do this one. So 5 goes down. So 21 with 89. And I do not compare 5 anymore, right? Because 5 went there. So 21 with 89. Is 21 bigger than 89? No. So this goes down. 21 and these are going to be compared 80 89 and 2 is 89 bigger than 2 yes then swap 2 and 89 then 2 do we have anything to compare 89 with no 89 now we guarantee that this after the first iteration the biggest element is at last right now you can do this, you can do this, or you can do them without basically doing the same thing, but a little bit differently. Okay, the way I'm going to compare them is um, first I compare all the iterations, then I do all the iterations, then I copy what I have at top. So 7 with 21, is 7 bigger than 21? No. Is, um, in here, is a 21 bigger than 5? Yes. So, 5, 21. Is 25, a 21 bigger than 89? No. So, continue. Is 89 bigger than, um, 2? Yes. So, 2 and, um, 89. So, then I copy these things. So, 7, 5, 21, 2, 89. Okay, doing the second iteration. And we put a line in here. Uh, sorry. We put a line in here because now we guaranteed that um, this is the small, uh, the largest, right? What we have in here is we were putting a line in here, right? When we are done. Now we are putting the line in here. So, starting again. Is 7 greater than 5? Yes. So swap. 5 and 7. Is 7 greater than 80, uh, 21? No. 
Is 21 greater than um, 2? Yes. Swap. Then, are we done? We have the variant here? Yes. So, 89 goes the way it was. Then, 21, 2, 7, 5. Okay, the third iteration. We have our barrier in here. So we do, is 5 greater than 7? No, 7 greater than 2? Yes. Then, 5, 2, 7, 21, 89. And we move the barrier in here. So the last iteration is going to be, is 5 greater than 2? Yes. 2, 5. And we have 89. 21, 7, 5, and 2. We have the barrier in here. Do we have anything to compare this with? No. So this is your final sorted array. This is your final sorted array. And that's it. And that's it. This is the how we have done it. This is how we have done it. And I have another example for you in here, so you can try at home. And um, this is going to explain everything iteration by iteration. Iteration by iteration. So what we have done, and every time we are done with comparing, we have things in here. So this is the first iteration. This is the result of the second iteration. This is the result of the third iteration. This is the result of the fourth iteration. And how many iterations do we do actually is the size of the array minus one. Size of array five minus one, we have four iterations. This is what we have. Okay, class activity, create a bubble sort. So create an in array of size 10, and initialize it to um, some random numbers off the top of your head. And um, write the code that will use the bubble sort algorithm to sort the array in ascending order, smallest to largest. And I'm going to show you actually when I solve it in front of you, um, how do we actually do largest to smallest. And after your, um, your array is sorted, write out um, the numbers to the console. So pause the video, try to do it on your own, and um, I'll go, I'm going to show you the answer to it. Okay, so going to see the um, answer to this one, let me just first copy the bubble sort because I would need it in my solution. And I'm going to try it in here. So let me just um, remove this. I would have it at the top in here. I can have it at the top or at the bottom, but if I put it at the bottom, then I need a prototype in here, right? So I just put it at the very top. And I'm going to create an int array. Well, I'm going to call it x. Um, and my array is going to be of the top of my head, right? Of the top of my head. So 21, 3, 4, um, 87, 2345 that's it that's it then i'm going to call bubble sort bubble sort and i'm going to give it x and how many elements do i have which is i have six elements right i have six elements then i'm going to use a for loop um that would print and I up to um, six elements, and I would print each element x of i. Let's see if those were sorted or not. Now you can see they are not sorted, right? Let me see if I'm getting them sorted or not after using this one. Now, they're going to be sorted ascendingly, so smallest to largest. So we'd have 3, 4, 21, 32, 45, 87. So, sorted. How do we sort them largest to smallest? Actually, what you will do is just flip the sign in here. Flip the sign. So that was greater than, now we say less than. Now it's being 87, 45, 23, 21, 4, 3. And that's it. That's it. This is how you actually do it in code. That simple. Okay. 
So a rare review, when do you set the size of an array? Now the answer to that is when it's being created, when it's created. Can you change the size of an array once it's created? No, uh, this is a definite no. When um, accessing an array, um, does the compiler check to see if the access is legal? No bound checking, no bound checking, this is left to you. How are arrays passed to functions? By default, by reference, without the need for the ampersand. Okay, so we can store any data type in an array. Uh, we can say int array 10. Um, we can have it of type color. If we have color or anything else, we can have double, whatever you want, right? We can also have an array of arrays. Array of arrays or multidimensional arrays. So, multidimensional arrays, um, we can have the same thing. But whenever you add one more dimension, you add the size inside a curly, uh, not a curly, uh, square brackets. That's it. This is adding one more dimension. So creating two dimension, pretty much th this is like a matrix, right? This is like a matrix. So this, we have five rows and every row we have an array of 10 elements you can think of it as rows and columns right rows and columns so array 2 of 0 this is going to return to you an array of int elements right array of 0 this is indicating that this is an array of int elements array of 0 1 this is looking at one location so if you use the two dimensions then you're accessing elements if you're using just one dimension then you're talking about one full array of something if you're using none of the dimensions then um you're using you're talking about the whole array of array so this is called multi-dimensional arrays or multi-subscripted arrays so how to create such thing the data type, the variable name, and for each dimension you need uh, square brackets and the size. If you want to use initializer list, you can. And if you want to initialize all the elements to zero, you would use a curly brace for each um, di uh, dimension and you have zero. So with one dimension you use zero, for two dimensions you add another set of curly braces. If you're using um, the uh, initializer list, you can set for the two arrays, each array of three elements. This is one full array and this is one full array separated by comma. That's it. So this could be written this way. Comma, another array, comma, and the semicolon. So this is one and this is two separate by comma and this is for the two dimensional array so using all dimensional arrays so int student scores num classes um student per class so assuming that i have multiple classes and i have um certain number of students in each class so this assumes that in all my classes I have the same number of students. So assuming that I have 35 uh, students in each of my classes. So assuming that grades are inputted somehow, if I want the total score so I get the average, I would use an embedded for loop. So usually with arrays, for each dimension, you need a for loop. So if you have one dimension, you just go over with one for loop. Two dimensions, you need another embedded for loop. Three dimensions, another embedded for loop, and so on, right? And when you access the element, you access it by the two dimensions. And um, I and J, the first one saying, for each array and this for each element of the arrays and so on so you added the scores to the total you get the total eventually um, then you divided uh, the total by number of classes times a number of students this is the total number of students in all my classes so passing multi-dimensional arrays the function this is a little bit tricky so you only leave blank 
the first dimension and every other dimension must be passed with its size so the fir the uh, array parameter is going to be int scores the name of my array whatever um variable i would use right then the first one is left empty and the others are um including the their sizes and the parameter you have, the other parameter you have, is the size of the uh, first dimension. So the first dimension is the one that is left empty. Okay, this is the one that is using average score. Um, it's basically doing the same thing we have done in here. I just showed you that. And always remember that arrays are always passed by reference, whether it's um, a one dimension array, two dimensionals, three, five, million, whatever. Always passed by reference by default without the need of ampersand. Okay, we are going to use this average score um, function in an application. So this is the prototype of the function that takes in scores. Um, this is again left empty. This is taking the uh, number of students, which is assuming it's 35. And uh, we pass the first dimension size and as a separate parameter. So um, assuming that I um, filled the in, um, student scores, then I use it this way. Again, again, whenever you pass an array to a function, Regardless of how many dimensions it has, always just the variable name, just the variable name, never add square brackets, no, just the variable name. Okay, um, so what do you think there is a wrong or um, something does not make much sense in this example? So what's wrong is that we assume that all classes with 35 students. In real life, I do not have exactly 35 students in all my classes. I may have one with uh, 35, one with 37 because I accepted another two uh, over the quota. And uh, the other, I may have 18. So we have to handle all these cases, right? So how could we solve such a problem? Is using a sentinel value is using a sentinel value. Now you can use it in one of two ways. One, whenever you um, inc uh, whenever you put a, a student score in the array, you put the next one as negative 99 or negative 1 or negative. Usually you, you, we use negative numbers. Negative 99, negative 1, negative 2, whatever number you would use. Or you can initialize all your elements to the sentinel value. And once you put a student score, it's going to replace the negative 99 in that location, right? But other locations are going to be filled with negative 99 and so on. So it's up to you. Now, we're going to, to modify our average score. Now, the average score is not only going to iterate over all the elements. No, it's going to check whether the element is equal to the sentinel value. If it's equal to the sentinel value, it's not going to add it to the total and it will stop that loop, right? So, you go through the elements, assuming that this is what you have. This is representing an array. So we go through this array. So this is going over the rows. So for the first row, for the first row, I go over all the elements until I find negative 99. The end. You can have it negative 1, whatever. So as long as you are not past the size of the array and, and, you are not having negative 9. If you have negative 9, 9, do not add it to the score. How do I actually get before, before I was doing this when I find the average? I was saying, okay, the total divided by the number of classes times the number of students, assuming that all classes with the same number of students. But now I need a counter, right? I need this counter. 
because this counter only counts the actual student scores, not the negative 99. And then I return the rule divided by student count. So a class exercise for you. So calculate the class average for each class and so determine which class has the highest class average. To do so, you need to create a two-dimensional array, six times three, 30. And um, this is basically seeing that I have six classes of 30 students. You don't need to um, deal with the sentinel values and assuming, just assume that all classes are of the same number of students. So each class is full of 30 students. Fill the array of random numbers between 55 to 100 and use embedded for loops to um, determine the class with the highest average. And um, so you would say I have six classes and report each class's average and just remind me which one is um, having the highest average. So display each class average and then remind me of which one is of the highest average. So pause the video, read through this exercise and do it in your Visual Studio. Then come back to see the answer. Okay, so here is the answer to it. Here is the answer. Assuming that you created this array and you know how to fill it with the number with uh, numbers of uh, 55 to uh, 100. Assuming that you know all this and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how we actually handle the averages and each uh, and how we do we report the highest average. So I needed the total. I needed the average and I needed the highest average. So I have embedded for loop, right? For each class, for each class, I would reset the total. Then I would add the students, uh, score, the student scores in this class to the total. When I'm done, when I'm done, I do total divided by number of students, assuming it's 30, right? So um, average, I have the average. And I always, always have the highest average. I would have the highest average. Now, since the average is always going to be above the zero, I initialize the highest average with zero. And if the highest average is greater, if the average, the current average of my, of the class I'm counting is greater than the highest average, I would store it in the highest average and I would print class I has this average. This is how I display all of them. To the students then eventually I remind you with the highest average say class with the highest average is the highest average this was the highest average okay now can we make three-dimensional arrays yes we can there is no limit to the number of dimensions basically this is depending on your stack size the stack size also depending um, how much the operating system is allowing your program to have a size for the stack and the um, RAM size that you have okay now why is that because we usually go um, for one to three because it's easier to picture. If you can, if you're so smart to picture more than three dimension rays, then do it if you want. So this is a three dimension ray, right? This is how do we create three dimension rays. So basically, th uh, this is assuming that we create um, three. Um, dimension. So this is uh, three dimensions, meaning I have the first dimension, second dimension, third dimension. Now we are creating um, in each array we have ten elements, and um, in we have five five rows, each row with ten elements, and we have five. You can think of them plates or matrices. We have three matrices, so matri matrix one, matrix two, matrix three, each matrix with five rows and ten columns. You can think of it this way. So if I tell you array two, this is my variable name, of zero, zero, one, I'm asking you go to the first matrix 
and go to the first array uh, row of that matrix and go to the second element. This is second element of the first row of the first matrix. If I do, uh, and this is returning to you an int, right? An int. And if I do 0, 0, then I'm talking about what, so I lost one dimension, right? If I lost one dimension, then I'm talking about one full array. If I lost, this is one full array, right? Array of ints. If I lost two dimensions, then I'm talking about two dimensional array. Two dimensional array. If I lost the three dimensions, then I'm talking about the three dimensional array, like this one. So here is something. If I have this, foo, four, five, six, I have three dimensional array. So this is evidently three dimensional array. This, talking about an element. This, I lost two dimensions, then I'm talking about two dimension array. I lost one dimension, then I'm talking about one dimension array. One dimension array, two dimension array, an element, three dimensional, three dimensional array. Okay, something in you um, to learn in C++11. So, how do I use I in here? I use it as the index, right? If I have something like this, I'm going to sum all the elements in my array, I do this, right? And sum equals zero, I iterate over all my elements, then I add each element to the sum. Okay, that's good. Now, I have something called for each. I have something called for each. Now, for each is another way to do for loops. But I'm saying for each element i, of type int in my array A, or usually we say in my container, in my container, because for each is used for containers, vectors, arrays, queues, stacks, and all these things. In my container, do something to that element in this way, and this um, statement I added to the sum. Again, the way I do it, the way I do it, the way I say it, for each, element i of type int in the container a do something to i to the element and this statement i added to the sum now the way it's being done is i do what is the type of this element it's int int and i create a variable name whatever variable name you use i x z whatever then colon this says in and container in the container colon and the container so assuming that i have um int a two three four five six and um i have sum equals zero for int i in a sum plus i this is the way i do it right for each element of the this type in the container do something to the element right so let's look at this example because this is something so critical I need you to look at. So if I have this array and I said, okay, uh, for each element in that array, for each element i of type int in that array, um, increment the i, then um, increment the i and then print it. It's going to print 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. But if, if, if I do this, I print the array again, I see that I did not change the elements. I did not change the elements. But wait a second, isn't that array is always passed by reference? Yes, but not in for each, because in for each you were copying each element. You're copying each element. So for each does not modify the array. A regular for loop like this one, if you modify the array, so if we do i of i plus plus, this is actually going to make this three permanently. And this is temporally, this is just modifying the variable, not the actual element. Okay, so basically, 
basically if I want to make the compiler know that I'm pa uh, I want to modify the element itself I can do ampersand this is basically doing passing by reference passing each element by reference and then I now is another reference to that element and so on in each iteration I is going to be changed so yes we achieve our goal by modifying the elements of the array by just adding the ampersand okay now we know that ray of i basically those square brackets were giving you a reference to the array element you were giving them the index and they were giving you a direct reference to the array element okay now class activity try it out so go try it out and come back okay so how about using for each loop with two dimensional arrays so we want to use a for loop to fill two dimensional array with random numbers we are going to use the same example we have this is how we fill um, our two-dimensional array with um, value with um, random numbers with values 55 to 100 right this is how you did it in um, the example or the exercise before right so can I say for each array because I know this is an array right so can I say for each array in the two-dimensional array for each number in uh, for each element in the array this is and I have the ampersand I suppose that this is going to work right but actually this is not going to work why because arrays are not normal variables so we need a go around solution that um, solve this for us now before I show you how we are going to solve it you have to understand the keyword auto because it's going to be used as part of our solution to this problem so auto allows the compiler to determine the data type at compile time Th this is basically up to the compiler to define what is the type of the variable so when I do auto i the compiler is going to deduce what is the type of i from the assignment or the assigned number so 12 is a, a, uh, an integer so it's going to say integer and it's always going to use the default like int double character and all these things 1.5 is double so d is going to be set as of double ch this is character so this is going to be of type character and if we have used um double quotes it's going to be a string and so on but but if you're dealing with um, function return type, the return type of two upper is actually int. So cur through ch2, basically this auto is going to be replaced by at compile time. You're not going to see it on in code, but it's going to be replaced in the object code. So this is going to be replaced with int. When you print it, it's going to print an int to the console not the character okay that said that said the way we solve this problem this problem we cannot see int arrays uh, for each int array is doing this for auto and we must have the ampersand why because auto says for auto array in array two dimension now the compiler is going to say, okay, this is two-dimensional array, but auto, auto what? To tell the compiler that this is something passed by reference, add this. So we actually need this, or it won't compile. For auto this, and this now is going to be considered as, as one-dimensional array. This is one dimensional array right now. And then you do this if you want to print. If you want to modify, you would use the ampersand.
So this is a solution to our problem. Auto ampersand for the array level and um, int ampersand for the element level. And now you are actually referring to that element. You can modify it. So here is a programming activity for you. Replace the four loops in our solution with four eaches. For eaches. For both, for both, filling the student scores and for using them in getting the averages. Pause the video and go do it. Okay, assuming you came back um, and you tried to do it, uh, hopefully you succeeded to do it. Here is the solution. Here is the solution. I would replace this for loop with this one. And um, this I'm just going to use I, right? And I do not need to modify it because I need to just read it. If you're filling the array, then you need the ampersand. That's it. That was it. Okay, so for each loop is great. It's a great idea when you need to cycle through all the elements. But can you use it to uh, cycle or iterate over some elements? No. So for each always loops all over the elements. And the elements axis are copies unless you specify otherwise using the ampersand like this. Always copies unless you specify it otherwise. Okay, let's talk about vectors. So vectors are mother replacement for arrays some benefits of vectors they are comparable in efficiency to arrays they're more efficient than arrays and we are going to see why they're normal data type so can be accessed uh, so they can be passed to a function either via or by reference or by value they can use the Assignment operator also. You can um, create an, an empty vector and assign an elements of previous vector into it. Efficient indexing. They use this. They use this. And this does you no, this do you no error checking. And the range is the same, zero to the size of vector minus one. And you, um, can change the size of the vector. Okay, with the rays, they were fixed, right? Vector is changeable. The vector size is changeable. You can add items, remove items, you can do whatever you want with it. We said with those, even though we use them with vectors, because actually the problem is with those, not with arrays. So with those square brackets, there is no bound checking. With at, which something, it's a function we are going to use with vectors, only with vectors, we can have bounds checking. If you want to use vectors, you must include the vector library. So creating an initializing vector. Automatically initialize at creation initialized with zeros so victor and then you need angular brackets with the type this is how it's being done victor angular brackets with the type victor name then victor size in parentheses now if if you did not specify what element you want to fill with it's going to fill the victor with zeros so this is the prototype of it victor T stands for the data type, and then you would uh, you would give a variable name, and you would have the size. This is your initial value, initial value, and we are going to show you how. So if I use Victor double, this is my Victor name. I have three elements. Each element is going to be five point four. So five point four, five point four, five point four. 
and so on. So here is creating. So what if I want to create a vector, but I want an empty vector. I want to add elements later. Can you do that? Yes, you can. You can create an empty vector. This is a vector of type int. This is the name and the size of zero. There is no elements. Then you can also create a vector based on a user input. You couldn't do that with array. With arrays, you could you could have done it with two things. Either letters like 5, 10, 15, 5, 20, or const variable, right? For vectors, you can do it with whatever you want, as long as it's of type integer, because the size reasonably should be integer. So, integer user input, cn, I take the user input from the user, then I set it as my size for the vector. Okay, you can also use initializer list the way you used it with arrays, the way you used it with arrays, like this. And no need to specify the size in the brackets, no. You don't do that. You just do vector int, the vector name equal this. Now this is one, two, three, four. Vector string, vector of strings, v4 cat dog monkey. Now with cat dog monkey, Victor have a size function, so no need to actually pass the size to a function as separate parameter or anything. With for loop, you can do v4 dot size. It's going to give you the size. No need to remember what, how many elements you have. You can just say Victor the Victor four v4 dot size. This is going to give you three for three elements. So you can do that. Also, also, you can use the square brackets with no error checking. It's up to you what to use. If you want error checking, it's faster to use the square brackets, but safer to use the dot f. So if I'm using for int i zero i less than three, so zero, one, and two. Print v4 of i, this prints cat, dog, and monkey. But if I do list than or equal, remember there is no error checking, it's going to print a garbage value because you are printing something in here. Right? This printing garbage value. The safer way is to use dot at. This prints cat, dog, monkey, and then, then, if you try to print Four, which is something in here, gives you a runtime error that says, okay, you accessed an element that you weren't supposed to access. Okay, class activity, change the bubble sort, change the bubble sort um, to some to a bubble sort function that uses vectors. And do not pass the size. Pause the video and do it. Okay, assuming you did that, I'm going to do it in front of you. So here is the function, bubble sort. Uh, first, to be able to use vectors, I need to include vector. Right? Then I'm going to change this into vector. So vector of n, and I'm going to call it x. Now this receives victor, so I will change this victor int, uh, I call it a, or we call it array, uh, I, I wouldn't call it array because it's confusing, I usually should have a meaningful name, so a would do it. Now we can have n, right, and this will still work, this will still work. But remember that I can always use the dot size. Here is sorted. Here is. Um, so basically, oh, well, one more thing I didn't mention. That if you did that, if you did that, you would find that this is passing by value, right? With arrays, we were guaranteeing that we are passing by reference. So now this is not, this is not doing anything to you, right? So 
the solution to it is just doing passing by reference now passing by reference has got to do it so now you get to see um, a sorted function so we sorted um, this function largest to smallest if you want smallest to largest again just flip the sign okay now we don't want this we don't want this we just want to pass the victor so you'd need to change every n with the victor dot size and size is a function so you should include this and again here a dot size and it's a function so you include it with with the uh, parentheses so and here if you want to print it again um you do x dot size x is the name of my vector x dot size and that should do it that should do it again um, if you want to always just read that's it if you want to read from a vector you don't have to pass it by reference but since we are actually modifying the vector we are passing that by reference okay that said that said let's just try dot at at i and try it so at i is going to do the same thing for you as long as you are within the range you're doing fine within the range so this size is six so i list zero to five range is zero to five this is going to do it it's fine but if we did this less than or equal which basically trying to access something that we don't have access to then um, we should get a runtime error we should get a runtime error here it is an exception an exception is a runtime error that basically out of range you're out of range so usually usually if um, you would do this not using it not using it if um, you would do the uh, curly braces um, this um, should be able to not to do any bound checking but with uh, not dots not dots no uh, bound checking for this one and um, the result is going to um, be messy why because it's going to give you it's going to fail your program in the new compilers in the previous older compilers it's just going to read a garbage value this is fail your program right okay going back to our lecture so we have something called resize so a resize function gets you um, to be able to resize your um, vector based on the new size and if you're growing your uh, your vector size you can initialize the new elements with a value so the number of elements in the vector is changed to the new size to achieve this size elements are deleted or added based on what you're doing deletion if any um, performed is going to be at the very end addition always adding to the end also the new elements are initialized to the second parameter to this one if it exists if you did not have such a parameter uh, an argument then it's going to assume you're um, resizing and the new elements are going to be zeros so here's an example victor of int vict four and zero so this is i'm um, creating a vector of four elements all uh, initialized to zero then i'm resizing my so only if i'm growing the size it's going to look at this one so resizing um growing with extra four elements so four to eight the difference is four i'm initializing the new elements with two if I'm resizing and I'm um, um, shrinking the size from eight to three, so I'm deleting eight, uh, five elements. So I'm deleting those five elements. I do not look at this one. I'm just looking at what is the new size, and it's going to be the zeros. 
Then um, if I'm resizing to 5, resizing this to 5, and I did not have any argument, it's going to assume it's 0, because by default, the default value is 0. So adding two extra elements with 0 value. So assuming that we have an example. So I have a my list of 20 elements. So this is a vector, my list of 20 integers. And I'm asking the user to input the elements. And I have get list that gets the um, um, gets the values from the user. Um, I'm going to do exactly what I've done with arrays before in the previous slides. I'm going to have int n. This is my counter. You can call it cnt, whatever. Um, counter. As long as we are not beyond the size and we can read, put into here and do I, uh, n plus plus or plus plus n. So if you want to stop, uh, uh, if I want to have one, two, three, four, and that's it, then I would uh, put a garbage value like a or anything that would corrupt my input. Then this returns false, right? And then I resize my element only to 4. My vector, sorry, to 4. So instead of having 20 elements um, using 20 spaces, it only uses the 4 entered only. So that makes the vector smaller. This is one use of the resize function. So we have also two functions we can use. Pop back and push back. Pop back is just removing the element from the vector without returning it. As you can see, it's void. It's just removing the vector, um, the vector's last element. So it's decrementing the size by one. Push back is putting an element into my vector, assuming that I have this one, two, three, four, five. It's adding one element and incrementing the size by one. So if I do push back five, it's adding another five in here. And the size is incremented by one. That's it. So going back to the same um, get values. So get values, we can now say, here's an empty vector. Get values, instead of specifying the size from the beginning, I can create an empty vector and I can push elements. Whenever you get an element, push it. Whenever you get an element, keep pushing elements as long as you're getting elements from the user. If you want to stop, add something that will corrupt the input, right? A or B, whatever. So we have size versus capacity. So the size is not the capacity. The size is um, the number of elements that are being used in my vector. The capacity is how many elements I have in my vectors reserved. The size is always less than or greater than the uh, the capacity. I'm going to show you what do I mean by size versus capacity. So if I do this, if I do this, I create a vector of five integer and by default they're initialized to zero. So when I say initialized then the size is five and the capacity is actually five because this is what I only need. But if, if you want to change that, you want to change that, now you can push back another element. You can push back another element. And the size is incremented. Remember when I do push back here, the size is incremented. And here is the size is decremented with, with uh, pop back. So the size is incrementing. And the capacity, this is incrementing by one, but the capacity with old compiler were doubling. The capacity were doubling. Here is the size not equal to the capacity. Also, if I created just empty, empty vector, the size and the capacity would be zero and zero, right? When you do this, when you do this, then the capacity is 2 and the um, size is 1. So usually that is going to double the, si the size, double the previous capacity. The previous capacity were 0, then 1, then 2, then 4 in the previous compilers. So this is how uh, we are go I'm going to show you 
that evolves or that um, increments. So this is our little experiment. So we have an empty vector and we are printing the size and capacity, right? And whenever the capacity changes, we are going to print the previous capacity and the new capacity, okay? This is what we are going to do. This is going to show us the growth pattern in our vector. Um, we are going first to test an old compiler and we are going to have this code. We are going to have this code. Whenever the capacity changes, not equal to the previous capacity, print me the new size and the new capacity. That's it. So the, the old growth pattern, the old growth pattern, when the size was one, the capacity was four. Okay. Then when we increment it, when the capacity changes, the capacity doubles to eight. When we kept adding, as, as you can see, we are just pushing zeros, right? When we kept adding elements, when we reach the capacity, it's going to be fine. But when we, uh, when we try to add beyond the capacity, the capacity doubles and we add our element and so on. So as you can see, the capacity doubles when needed. Doubles. Now, the growth algorithm has been changed in the newer versions of compilers. So for your Visual Studio 2019, you're going to find this. This is a smart AI. This is a smart artificial intelligence. This is when the size is zero, the capacity is zero. The size is one, the capacity is one. As you can see, it's not going to double. Size two, two, three, three. So two doesn't, is not four. Then four, four. Now the compiler learns your growth pattern. Learns your growth pattern. Then, and anticipating that you're going to add more. So, doubles, uh, add just two elements. Then add three elements. Then add four elements. Okay, you're, you keep going. Five elements. Then, learns that you may need more than three, four, five. Then gives you nine elements. Then, thirteen elements. And so on. So this is a smart AI, the smart algorithm, it's AI algorithm, and it's implementation dependent. So it varies from um, compiler to compiler, but this is the one you're going to see in your Visual Studio 2019. Okay, we have a function called reserve. So it's more efficient to give memory in larger blocks rather than needing to gradually growing the uh, through doubling or through something like this, because this takes time. When you um, reserve, so you anticipate that my class is going to have 35 students, I would keep adding up to the 35. I would not need to go do some work to reserve a memory, right? Because that takes time. But when needed, you can um, let the compiler increment the capacity by the um, growth pattern based on the compiler. But for reserve, you can reserve ahead of time, right? So this reserves uh, space for n elements based on the n elements that you have. And this is takes size t, usually in integers. Changes the capacity, not the size. So this is setting the size. So uh, setting the capacity, not the size. So if I have empty vector and I reserved 100 elements, what is my size of, uh, what is the size of my vector and what is the size, uh, the capacity of my vector? The size is still zero. None is initialized, right? None of the elements is initialized. But I have them reserved. I have locations for them. It's like when I have a room filled of chairs. I have chairs. I do not still have people in there. This is the capacity versus the size. The size, I may have a hundred shares, but I have only 53 um, persons. This is capacity versus size. I have empty shares, I have empty locations. Okay, going to the previous example. Um, here's the previous example. We can use re uh, reserve. Reserve is, I'm going to ask the uh, user how many numbers you would like to enter and the user is going to say okay I would enter for example 50 numbers so I would add just a wiggle room 
a wiggle room. Why? Because I'm not going to let it 50. Then when the user say, uh, when the user enters like 52, I would need to double the 50 on the old growth pattern or um, do some work to figure out what um, increment I would do to the capacity. What I would do is 20, right? 20. Then I would keep getting things from the user, keep getting things. And um, that would um, have this filled. So I reserved elements without the need of um, growing my vector every time I reach out the capacity. So can we have multidimensional vectors? Yes, we can. And it's pretty much the same way when you use initializer list if you're using initializer list. How? Vector. And what is this? This is, we were doing array of array. Now inside the angular brackets, we are going to say vector of int. So this is a vector that will contain vector of ints. So with arrays, with arrays, you were doing this, right? You were doing this. This is a reference to another array, and this is a reference to another array. This is exactly the same thing we are doing right now. We say for each element in my vector this is going to be a reference to another vector another vector right this is how it's actually being done since vectors are normal variables since vectors are normal variables you can use um for loop embedded for loop the same way you used it with um arrays but now you can use the benefit of having a size function, right? A size function. So for grades of size, this is how many classes I have. For grades in each class, the size of each class, right? The size of each class, do something, print it, for example. Print it, print the score. So also you can use a for each. Now the for each is being used without any problem. But always make sure that you know what you are doing, whether it's passing by reference or passing by value. So if you're just reading, if you're just reading, then you can say Victor uh, for each Victor in the two-dimensional Victor. For each grid in this vector, right? For each grid in this vector, do something to the grid. If you also you can use auto. You can use auto. Auto is um, working just fine without the need of the ampersand. Without the need of the ampersand. With vectors, you can just use auto. So um, basically. If you want to pass by reference, you need the ampersand in here also. You need the ampersand in here and in here. If you want to reference, uh, reference the elements. Okay, that said, that said, what do you think the output would be if I have vector of vector of integers? Uh, I have it called grades and I have size of four. So what is the input? I'm trying to print the elements of these uh, of this two-dimensional vector. What is the input? Actually, the input is nothing. Why? Because you were creating four empty vectors. You were saying, I want to reserve locations for, em for four empty vectors, like this. But do we have actual vectors, those? No. The answer is no. So what do you need is to fill them. How do you fill them? You can use resize. You can use resize. You can say for each of the victors, for each of the victors, resize um, each vector, resize each vector of the inner vectors of those with um, class number plus plus, basically that should fill them with ones, twos, threes, and fours, right? Four elements of ones, four elements of twos, and so on, up to fours. And then print them. If we print them, is it going to print anything again? 
still empty. Remember, these are normal variables, unlike arrays. So you need to specify that you are dealing with passing by, since you are filling them, resizing them, you're resi what you're doing, you're resizing the copy. But you need to resize the original. To resize the original, you need reference to the original, which is this one. Which is this one. Now, CLS now is having a reference, right? Is a reference to the elements. So now we get ones, twos, threes, and fours. So you can also get rid of this one and you can use for loop. Again, this is providing you an immediate direct access, these square brackets, without the need of the ampersand or anything. These indexing gives you a reference to the data itself. So you can do it, right? You can do it this way. Now, if you're using for each, don't forget that you would need to specify what kind of ref, uh, passing you're doing, by reference or by value. Okay, last exercise, go do um, the code of having the average of classes. Now, do it as vectors, not arrays, but vectors. Creating vectors. Fill the vectors of random numbers of 55 to 100, then um, do it one with four each, and not one with for loop. Here is the for loop for you and do it with for each. So uh, this is something that would um, let you learn a lot. Here is the solution. Here we have a vector. You have the elements, you are uh, assuming that you fill them with random numbers. We are doing exactly the same thing. Since we are just reading, we don't need to uh, do the ampersand, right? We don't need the ampersand in here. So, um, we are just reading here and we are taking the elements, adding them to the total and doing exactly the same thing we have done before. Okay, one last Victor challenge and I'm going to challenge you on this. How would you create an 8x8 eight eight two-dimensional vector of integers that is all initialized to zeros? So you need, basically, what I'm saying is you need a matrix of 8x8, eight eight, a board, 8x8, eight eight, and all initialized to zeros. Zero, 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 zero. In one line, in one line, or actually in one statement. How would you do that? Okay, pause the video, think about it, and come back to see the solution. Okay, here is the solution. I'm creating vector of vector of integers, right? I'm going to call it game board. Eight, eight creates eight spots. But they are not filled yet. How do I fill them? I fill them with a vector of eight elements each initialized to zero. You can just do eight without the zero. That will work too. But this is the solution. This is the solution. So this creates this part, creates this, eight spots with um, eight zero, um, empty, right? And this is going to fill each one with eight zeros. Eight zeros. And that's it. So this is our lecture for today. Um, have a great day and see you in the next one.